As you can see, the girls with a bit of finesse have decorated me. Uh, we didn't quite have palms, but we had uh, plastic green plants that look beautiful. And, uh, and I hope you're well. Uh, it's still very strange and almost foreign to uh, have you uh, at home. And I'm sitting here with a few team members. I'm blessed and we're encouraged by the ACC, our leaders of our movement. Uh, they actually position, petitioned to Canberra and now church has become a workplace uh, so that we can have more people. Well, effectively, we can have a maximum of 12 in this building, in this auditorium at any one time uh, as we do Sunday church. Uh, and, and I just thank God for a kingdom-minded prime minister. Can I encourage you, whether wherever you're at, uh, at all times in the day. Let's pray for Prime Minister Scott Morrison and the government. They're doing an amazing job. And I love how this epidemic has really put a focus on community and family and really humanity just pulling us all together so that we can get through this together. Uh, our prayers are with you. This morning, we're going to read from Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, verse 28. Luke chapter 19, verse 28. Uh, I'm going to read from the NIV version of my Bible. The scripture says here, After Jesus said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem, and he approached Bethpage, or as he approached Bethpage uh, at Bethany, where the hill is called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a young colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden before. It's important. Uh, untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say that the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead of him, they found the colt just where he had told them to go. And as they were untying the colt, the owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord has need of it, or the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus and they threw their cloaks over the colt and they put Jesus on the colt. As he went along, the people spread their cloaks on the road and palm leaves were also spread out. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of his disciples, Jesus' community, they began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Once again, Father, I just pray that you would help me to clearly articulate the point and the heart of what you're saying this morning. If I were to give this message a title, and please bear with us, uh, thank you again for inviting me into your home, uh, into your workspace, into your car, wherever you're watching this. Uh, the title this morning is Jesus, My Mighty Warrior. Say that with your family. Maybe you need to look in the mirror or in your screen right now. Jesus, My Mighty Warrior. In fact, Jesus is our mighty warrior. In such a time as this, that Jesus is our mighty warrior right now. Just to go through some uh, some. Some, some facts in the narrative that we're reading about Jesus arriving into Jerusalem. He's entering into a city which is Jerusalem. At this particular time, it's said there's roughly a population of about 800,000 people scattered throughout the city, plus some. And Jesus has been on a journey which effectively was roughly a 16-mile journey from Jericho into Jerusalem. And he's making this journey, and as he arrives into Jerusalem, he's coming to the end of this, this, this portion, as we know that we're arriving at the Easter week. And Jesus is about to do some teaching. He's about to clear the temple courts. And there's a lot of amazing, important things that come uh, from the rest of this week. But today, I specifically want to focus on this one passage of Scripture. Jesus is entering, and the way that he's entering clearly highlighting that he is our mighty warrior. You might not see it now, but you will in just a few minutes. It's said that when prophets were not taken seriously, and we can read that, we've all read it through the Old Testament of the Bible, such as Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and in 1 Kings we read about Samuel, the prophet. Often they would resort to dramatic action to lay a foundation for the breathed or the inspired prophetic word that they have delivered from God uh, to see that a foundation is right for it to take place. And uh, one writer wrote this, that what we're reading about Jesus is displaying just as a dramatic action as he's riding into Jerusalem in the way that would be unmistakable to make the claim that he is Messiah. He is the king that has come, that he is the anointed one chosen by God. There's four thoughts that I have as I read this and I pull apart the narrative of Jesus writing in. One, Jesus carefully planned this. 
This wasn't just a mistake. It wasn't just a whim. Jesus didn't just suddenly or impulsively do anything. Jesus never left anything for the last minute. In everything he did, he did it by prayer and petitioning God. We know, as we spoke last week, that when Jesus wasn't found in the morning, he wasn't in his bed where he went to sleep the night before, that the disciples found him and he was praying. He didn't respond to their fear and their worry of where he was. His response was, as he received a revelation from the Lord, not to enter into their fear, but to make a declaration. We need to go to the next town to preach the gospel. See, Jesus was calculated. He's the Son of God. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is our mighty warrior. Jesus, the second thought, was actually acting, and I want to specify this in a cautious way, in a kingdom way, Jesus was actually acting in a glorious way of defiance and displaying extreme courage. If you remember in John chapter 11, verse 57, I'm paraphrasing, but the Pharisees made this statement. They said, if anyone sees Jesus, if anyone hears of him, they must turn him in or bring him to us. We will have him arrested. So I say that he acted in a glorious defiance or an extreme courage from simply the sheer fact that he was coming through the front doors, that his disciples, the apostles were cheering. They were physically making action of throwing down carpets and mats and, and things in his path. There was a, a a forefront or that he, he was coming front and center. But see, here's the deal. Jesus was a wanted man. And Jesus was someone that had a bounty on his head. So he displayed courage in the way that he came in, knowing that this was the call, that this was the plan that God had for him. This was the roadmap to paying a price that none of us could ever pay. You could say that Jesus would have been all uh, with all due respect, in his right mind, able to go and do a ninja over the back wall of Jerusalem. He could have gone in, he could have snuck in, he could have gone unannounced, but Jesus didn't. Jesus displayed a courage. The third thought that I have, and we're going to pull this part in just a moment. Jesus was making a deliberate king, uh, sorry, a deliberate claim to be the king. What he was doing was fulfilling the prophetic destiny that had come through. We're going to read from uh, Matthew's gospel in just a moment about where, where he quotes Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Because this triumphant entry was always predestined to come from the prophetic utterance of the heartbeat of God. It defines him once again clearly as our mighty warrior. The last thought that I have is Jesus as he came in riding on a donkey on a colt, in fact, one year old, never been ridden before. Jesus was, we could say, making his final appeal publicly through this demonstration, through this narrative of him coming in. And, and effectively, in my mind's eye, I see Jesus coming with outstretched arms. It's a picture I always have of Jesus, never closed off, never guarded, but with outstretched arms coming into the city. One could say that Jesus was actually coming with love's invitation. One last time to the men, the women, the children, to the drug addicts, to the lost and the broken, to the rich, to the poor, the people of Jerusalem. He was coming with love's invitation, defining himself as Emmanuel, God with us. He effectively could have been, in this sense, with this narrative, in this context, he could have been given uh, effectively one last chance to uh, get to know him, to call on him, to, to draw near to him. The Bible says in James, if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. And I believe that was also what was happening. So let's pull this apart for just a moment. And this will be the main topical point for this morning. And we'll finish up not too long from now. But as Jesus is riding on the back of a donkey or a colt, as the scripture said, it identified that this colt had never been ridden before. He's coming in as king and conqueror. In Matthew's version of the gospel, as I alluded to before, Matthew puts this picture up and he quotes the inspired word of God that came through the prophet Zechariah. In Zechariah 9 verse 9, and I read it, he says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. It's interesting, and you need to understand the reflection of what this looks like as far as the donkey or the colt riding into the city. It's said that in the wider expanses of Palestine and even around Jerusalem, out in the countryside, a, a colt or a donkey is only ever seen as like a tool, an instrument that's used to plow. It's, it's just a common everyday object. 
But inside the city at this particular time, the cult actually is defined and is known and on the forefront of everyone's mind when they saw that donkey coming in, it actually illustrates a symbol of peace. So Jesus chose this instrument, this symbol of peace. He could have rode in on many other animals, on many other things. He could have just strolled on in, but he chose from the ground up. And this is the picture I'm trying to build for you. He came in, first of all, on something that they would have seen. And in the forefront of their minds, they were waiting for this conqueror, for this champion, for this mighty warrior. But then he came riding, not in what they may have perceived, but he came riding on a donkey that said to them, I'm coming in peace. If we were to go further and look up from this donkey and this colt, looking at the person of Jesus, I wouldn't have time today to sit here, in fact, in this week, uh, this month, to define all the amazing attributes of Jesus. But he did it so well, talking about himself in one sentence. In fact, Jesus only ever in the scripture made one autobiographical statement about himself. He only spoke about himself in this context once ever in the scripture. In the words that he used, he said, I am meek and I am lowly, which paints an interesting picture because someone that is meek and lowly, especially attributing that characteristic to Jesus, what it tells us is that he is available and he's also accessible. Someone that is meek and lowly is also available and accessible, which then completes the picture that we have of Jesus riding in on this donkey, which represented peace. And he described himself as the son of God being lowly and meek, which eventually says that he is accessible and available. It's important to get this. See, when I think about a champion, when I think about a mighty conqueror, where I think about a, a, a God who is, the, uh, is the, the warrior riding into the city, I think like probably you right now would go to places in your mind. One such uh, thought came to me this week as I did social studies in the United States. I remember learning about uh, a man by the name of Alexander. Uh, Alexander the Great rode on the back of a stallion. I believe it was name was Eusyphilis. Eusyphilis. And see, this is actually a worldview picture of what a mighty warrior looks like, but not necessarily in the kingdom. I think this is what they expected. Behind me, you'll see a picture come up, and it actually presents the two different paradigms, if you will, of what kingdom perspective of mighty warrior looks like, and then the world's perspective. And on this particular day, Palm Sunday, 2,000 plus years ago, it was at the forefront of everyone that was watching Jesus come in. I'm sure in their their mind's eye, they were expecting to see a a, a king ride in with a ready for battle on on a huge horse that looks like it's on steroids. But what they saw was peace and meekness and availability versus unapproachable, versus strength, versus domineering. And I hope you're starting to get the picture of where I'm going now. See, Jesus has come in. He's riding on the back of a donkey. He's meek and lowly. Jesus was born in a stable. He didn't grow up in a castle and uh, own a thousand acres of land. We know he's the son of God. He was with God, and we know who he is. But he didn't live life on this earth that way. The picture that Jesus presents to us as he rides in, this narrative of meek and lowly riding on peace, actually describes his life. And it describes truly the mighty warrior that we have now with us. You see, when we look at Alexander the Great, he was a mighty warrior in the worldview. But he's not living right now. He's not seated at the right hand of Father. He did not have a Holy Spirit of his own that he could send. He died, and he's now buried. But we know that Jesus is a true mighty warrior because he conquered death, and he overcame sin, sickness, and sorrow. He did it all for us on behalf of us so that we can call on his name. That's what makes him our mighty warrior. If we were to go on further, I need to elaborate on this a little bit more. Jesus' meekness also speaks of his willingness to place his total dependency on God. What more of a season or extremity of circumstances, for want of a better phrase, could we uh, approach right now in this planet 
not just one person, not just two, not just a country, but the whole planet is facing, where we actually truly need to define who is our mighty warrior. I want to tell you now is the time more than ever for us to get back to first priority of faith, placing our eyes back on Jesus and establishing in our family, in our faith, in our fitness, in our finances, in our workplace, in our hearts, in our minds, in our spirits, that Jesus is a God of peace, that He's a God who is meek, but He's also our mighty warrior. If I would have pulled this apart just a little bit further before we transition, I would say to you, we need to understand that meek and lowly actually carries with it a different meaning. To be meek and lowly, the word meek in the Greek actually is praus. And hear me with this, praus, meek, actually is defined by strength under control. Strength under control. So this whole time, we could be looking at Jesus, and, and from the worldview, you would think, man, that's a bit of a weak picture. That's quiet. He's timid. Yeah, we all want to give him a cuddle. But the undercurrent of Jesus saying, I am, I am meek and I am lowly, not out of pride, out of humility, he is actually saying, I display strength under control. We can see it with Jesus riding on the back of a donkey. I watched a movie just a few weeks ago where prisoners in the United States have a program attached to their prison. They're they're lifers. They're people that are never going to get out of jail. However, they're still trying with the hope that they can rehabilitate them. They can transform their minds and their hearts through this program. And what the program entails is that they will go out with their guards and their carers and, and they go out, or their wardens, I should say, and, and they go out into the countryside and they round up all the wild Mustangs, which is, uh, which is a big, rough and tough wild horse. And what they do is they bring the horses into a department of the prison and the prisoners are sent out and they will go out and their job is to break in the Mustang. In other words, to break in horses that have never had anyone sit on their back before. And as this, 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 this film, this picture that I watched described, it's a process of weeks, if not months, before anyone can ever get on the back of the Mustang because it's wild, because it's never had pressure on its back, because the Mustang in itself always desires to be the alpha male. But as I watched this show, it described a picture of a needing to build intimacy, a needing to build relationship, a needing for someone to come in and take authority. But Jesus, in the course of one day, hops onto the back of a colt, something that's never been ridden before. And you could almost say, well, that's a little bit of an unfair picture. It's just a donkey. But the truth is, the donkey could have run off. The donkey could have bucked Jesus but we see Jesus truly laying his heartbeat, his character out for us to see. In the fact that he rode the donkey, see it truly defines strength under control as he rode the donkey into Jerusalem. See, Jesus displayed that he was a mighty warrior. He displayed humility, he displayed peace, he displayed love in this moment. And that was the language he was putting out to the community, opening up his heart. Would they receive him? Because if they received him, he would go to them. In fact, he did that anyway. But on this particular day, as Jesus rode into the city, the people missed it. Jesus displayed it, but they missed it. When they realized that Jesus had not come to fulfill the desires to be their king in the way that they thought it would be, And this is a challenge to all of us to bring peace in a governmental, uh, maybe in a military or even a legislative way. The people who once upon a time, just uh, the day before or the couple of days before, who were laying down palm branches and their cloaks on the ground and they were shouting Hosanna and they were singing his praises and glorifying all the miracles that they'd seen actually turned their language to crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. You know, a thought that I have for you as we identify that Jesus is my Savior, that Jesus is my mighty warrior, I think and I feel in my heart right now the anointing to encourage you that it's time for us to put Jesus back in his place, in our view, in our perspective, in our heart, in our home, in our family unit, that Jesus is our mighty warrior. Jesus is the one that comes in peace. He's the one that paid the price that you and I could never pay. And he's still alive, seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He's now given us the free gift of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that we are seated in heavenly places. You might ask, how are we seated in heavenly places? I'm very much here in, in person, in physicality. My atoms, my, my, my makeup, my blood is here. But the Bible says that we have all received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And as we've received the gift of the Holy Spirit through the Spirit and by faith, we are now with Jesus in the heavenly realms. And I want to encourage you, that is an amazing place to pray for him, pray for him. That is an amazing place to live your life from, knowing that you are walking next to an in intimate relationship and identity with God. Uh, that is our identity. We are in relationship and intimacy, moving forward with our mighty warrior, Jesus. If we were to speak to the climate right now and not to give the pol politics of what's going on too much attention, but just even as your pastor... You know, we are in a place that really isn't okay. The day and the age and the climate and the bugs that are going around, like the planet is not in a good place. Uh, I truly believe that we will not just go back to normal. There won't be a day where 300, 350 people, where you all walk back in here, where there isn't some sort of scar, where there isn't some sort of damage. In fact, if we were to look through history, people that identified that Jesus was their mighty warrior and went with that heartbeat, that went with that language, were the people that expanded the gospel more than any other time in history. What I'm talking about is two particular times throughout the course of history. One, in the book of Acts, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit fell out on the church. And at that time of persecution, yes, they went and they gathered daily in the temple courts. And then they gathered in homes. Acts 2, verses 42 on tells us. And, and then they broke bread together and they did all of that. The Bible says the Lord added to their numbers daily. But none more, maybe one other time in history, did the church expand uh, than this. And that was in China. In fact, that is even right now, and it's starting to be overtaken by Iran. And it hasn't come by people gathering together in a corporate gathering of a building. I do that. I said this last week. I love it. It's my job. But I believe through the current climate of what's going on around us in our hospitals and our systems and our airports, everywhere right now, it's a provoking for us and an opportunity for us to reset and recalibrate, one, our priority of just putting Jesus first, remembering that He is our mighty warrior. By prioritizing our family and getting back to the family unit, which God caused us and created us for, to be in relationship with one another, to be wise in stewarding your finances and to look after your body, as the Bible says, that we, our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. See, my point in my last statement was to encourage you, knowing that Jesus is our mighty warrior, we need to get back to relationship. We need to get back to opportunities of seeking Him and making Him famous. We need to be intentional more than ever. I'm speaking from my heart. This is my challenge to myself to get back to the one-on-one, -on -one, face to face intimate relationships with individuals because we only get one opportunity to live on this planet, on this earth, and it is a beautiful place that God created for us. Everything flows from the heart. We have a reminder right now in front of us. And I want to share with you a few extremes as I now begin to close that Jesus really is our mighty warrior. Palm Sunday represents many different things. There's many different angles. You could pull apart all sorts of things to preach, but I think it's so important to remember that Jesus is a God of peace. He says, peace I leave with you. We know that peace that transcends all understanding comes only from him. We also know that Jesus came and displayed his true heart, his meekness, and that he is a God of strength under control. When I think about this, Jesus through meekness displays his availability and his access, accessibility to us. This is what truly defines a mighty warrior in my eyes. Yeah, uh, Alexander was a strong man, but he was unapproachable. He was unattainable. It was intimidating. But Jesus still to this day is approachable and is asking us to draw near to him and promising us that he will draw back near to us. See, right now you may be struggling with your job. 
your paycheck may have withered, but I want to tell you, we still have Jesus with us. He is our provider. He is Jehovah Jireh. You may have lost your confidence in the systems, but you have a God uh, that is a mighty warrior who sets the rules for how far the tides can come in, as he says in the book of Job. You may right now miss your freedoms. You may miss your liberty. You may feel awkward with social distancing, but the deal is that you still have the Spirit of the Lord. As the, the Scripture says that where the, the Lord is Spirit and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Uh, I want to read you a couple of Scriptures from Psalms 118, verses 5 down to 14. As David writes these Psalms, I just can't help but thinking what it would sound like if we transitioned where he puts, I cried to the Lord, to I cried to my mighty warrior, knowing that we're speaking of Jesus. When hard pressed, I cried to the mighty warrior. He brought me into a spacious land. Uh, the Lord or my mighty warrior is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? My mighty warrior, the mighty warrior, he is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. The Lord is with me. He is my helper, the mighty warrior. I look in triumph only on my enemies. It's better to take refuge in my mighty warrior than to trust in humans. It's better to take refuge in the mighty warrior than to trust in princes. All the nations surround me, but in the name of Jesus, my mighty warrior, I cut them down. They swarm around me like bees. They uh, were consumed quickly as burning thorns. In the name of Jesus, my mighty warrior, I cut them down. I push back or I was pushed back and I was about to fall, but the Lord, my mighty warrior Jesus, He helped me. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He's a mighty warrior, ladies and gentlemen. He has become my salvation. See, what makes Jesus our mighty warrior is that anyone and everyone who comes to Him can receive the free gift of salvation. You can receive the gift of life, the questions that you're asking about your purpose and your destiny and your future will be no more because as you invite Jesus in to relationship with you, He will make these things known. The Bible tells us that He knows the plans that He has for us, plans that are good, plans that will prosper us, plans that will lead us and guide us and keep us safe. He's a God of intimacy. He's not a God that sits on the shelf and that we bow down and we burn incense to. He's a God that comes in relationship. If I were to summarize this and to qualify my last statement, the emphasis of this morning, Zephaniah 3.17, prophetic utterances, the Lord your God is with you, your mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. His love will no longer rebuke you. Hear this, friends, but he will rejoice over you with singing. Even as I came into this auditorium this morning, uh, I was singing and I left my house and I, sh I left at the right time. I was singing Victory by Elevation. Uh, I can't even think of the words right now, but I was, uh, I was singing like an angel over my family and over my kids. I was, I was declaring it over them. And as I came in here upon Kent and a couple of the people that are in this room with me right now, I've just been walking around singing because there's a joy in me. But me singing... And worshiping around community is very different to our mighty warrior singing over us. Let me read that again. The Lord, your God, is with you. He is your mighty warrior, the mighty warrior who saves. He's the only one who can save you. He will take great delight in you. His love will no longer rebuke you. Listen to this, but he will rejoice over you with singing. Friend, when I put at the forefront that God is a mighty warrior, the person of Jesus who we're identifying right now in this context. And when I come to understand and I put myself into a place of just becoming aware of him, and I think about him singing songs over me, uh, I can't help but thinking as the Lord sings directly over me, that sickness will fall to the ground, that disease will fall to the ground, that mental health will fall to the ground, that oppression will fall to the ground, that there will be something in instituted, that something would be uh, placed in me, that, that there would be a faith that rises up uh, through the Spirit of God as He declares wonders over my life. And I just see it over everyone that's watching this right now, that the Lord, the mighty warrior, He's singing over your family. He's singing over your finances. He's singing over your circumstances. He's singing over your, your extended family. He's singing over your provisions because you are His uh, sons and daughters in Christ, that we walk in the identity. We are grafted in to relationship with God. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. As I close, I know that there's probably people listening to this that you've just somehow stumbled across this stream or a video 
be it now or at a point in the future. And you've heard me talk about this mighty warrior and in your heart something has come alive and there's almost a beckoning and a call to ask the question of how do I get to know this Jesus? I would say there's probably some other questions that are asked and Jesus said this in Luke, sorry, John chapter 6 verse 35. He said, I am the bread of life. He's the only one who can satisfy the deepest longings and hunger that we have within us because he's the one who makes possible relationship with God, the creator of heaven and earth. I'm going to lead you in a prayer in just a moment, but maybe right now you've never invited Jesus into your heart. Maybe you've never had this at the forefront of your mind or even in your spirit, this knowledge of Jesus being the mighty warrior. Maybe even right now you're watching and you know that you've slidden back, that you've gotten caught up in some old things and you just want to get things right with God. What Jesus is identifying is he says that he is the bread of life as one. He satisfies our hunger for meaning and purpose of life. Maybe right now you're watching this and you're just thinking, man, what is the purpose to all this? There's viruses going around, the economy's crazy, my job's gone. You're saying, what is the purpose to life? I want to tell you that the answer of that is found in the name of Jesus. The scripture says, anyone who calls on me, in fact, Jesus says, if you call on me, you will be saved. I want to tell you, friend, the answer to the question that you're asking, what is the purpose to my life is found in the person of Jesus When you call on his name, being the bread of life, he has the substance of everything we hope for. He will give you the answers to the deepest, darkest questions of your heart. And he will help you on the roadmap to life. The second thought that I have that Jesus is making here is is he satisfies our hunger beyond life. Right now is a time where people are asking themselves, what more is there to this life? People are asking themselves, okay, if I die, is there a heaven? Is there eternity? I want to tell you only in the name of Jesus can you have eternal life. The Bible says anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Saved in this life, you will receive the person of the Holy Spirit. You will begin relationship with God right now, the moment that you call on Him. But you will also, as that scripture says, by faith we believe that we will be saved and we will be with Him eternally in heaven after we die, hopefully a long, long time from now. And thirdly, what Jesus is saying is that he's the one that satisfies our hunger. See, deep down, if we're all being honest, we all know that we've sinned, which essentially means we've missed the mark, we've done things wrong. We could go into rules and regulations, but you know that you know deep in your heart where you've done things wrong that probably would come against a holy God. See, only in the name of Jesus can we receive forgiveness. Jesus is the one who brings us that by the death on his cross that we're going to celebrate over the course of the next week. But not just the death on his cross, the fact that Jesus rose again, which is what truly identifies him as our mighty warrior at this time, all the time. Friend, if you're here this morning, you've just heard me say or watching online that Jesus will give you the answer to the purposes of your life and help you to find a peace knowing that you're on the right track. Jesus is the one that salvation can be found, which identifies as eternal life after we die. And thirdly, Jesus is the one who can forgive you. The Bible says in the book of Romans that if we believe in our heart that Jesus is the Lord, to paraphrase it a little bit, that he came, that he was man, that he lived on this planet, he died. But as God, he rose again. He is now alive, seated at the right hand of the Father. I've alluded to a few times. The Bible says that if you believe that in your heart and you would confess that with your mouth in your bedroom, in your lounge, out by the pool area, wherever you are right now, the scripture says that he is faithful and we will be saved. So I'm gonna close in prayer and we're gonna finish today. In fact, I'm gonna encourage you after we pray and we pan out, Whether you're by yourself, whether you're with a couple of people, I know there's people watching on Zoom meetings right now, but maybe with your family, you'd take the communion, the bread and the wine. Now with this new proposition I've put in front of you, which is a reality that Jesus is our mighty warrior and putting Jesus back in the forefront of our minds as he's a mighty warrior, he's meek and he's strength and control, that he's a God that comes in peace, that he has his arms open with love that as we remember that his body was broken and that his blood was poured out to pay a price that we could never pay, 
as you take communion together in your home, but also once again for all our community and maybe friends and visitors that are watching from all parts of the world, if you've never invited Jesus into your heart, let me lead you in a prayer. I'm gonna close my eyes and just repeat after me. Dear Jesus, today I pray that you would forgive me for all of my sins. I believe in my heart and I'm confessing with my mouth that I believe that you are the Son of God who came, who died, but rose again. I ask right now and I thank you for your forgiveness. I choose to invite you into my heart and today I choose to begin to forgive myself for my past. Jesus, today, would you make me new? Would you lead me, guide me, and comfort me in the season we're in? Jesus, I choose you. Amen, amen.